industry, especially focusing on the industry academic interface. And we have students uh, partnering with the Berlin School of Business Innovation with our different partners. One of them is the Concordia University of Chicago, which is the CUC. We have the UCA London and the Union International um, uh, Italy. And we have uh, students studying a lot of different streams, focusing on management, business, um, uh, the bachelor's, the postgraduate, and the doctoral students, approximately making around 2,000 students um, every year for the program. And uh, the main objective of this session, because we had a previous session, uh, we have different focuses every month and different areas of interactions every month. The last session that we had was focusing on the cultural diversity uh, in Europe and uh, it was more on culture and foreign relations it was there and then like we thought let's have a discussion this time on international trade and that was where I felt you should be the right person down for this session and I'll just give a brief introduction for our participants who are here and uh, I'll give you an introduction about yourself uh, Kim and uh, yes uh, just to share down uh, Dr. Kim Zitlow was the director of what trend and innovation scouting at German trade and invest, uh, the GTEI. It's the Economic Development Agency of the Federal Republic of Germany. Dr. Kim leads the organization's activities regarding tech startups, trends, and innovations. He is responsible for the internationalization of the Digital Hub Initiative, a flagship digitalization project of the Federal Ministry for the economic affairs and the climate protection, aiming to build a leading digital startup ecosystem in Germany with a global reach. His team promotes the digital hub initiative at large tech events, builds an international partnership network and attracts the world's leading startups to Germany. Kim has more than 10 years of experience in working on for leading strategic and vertical consulting companies such as McKinsey, KPMG, uh, GISZ or the OPPO Global and served as Deputy Delegate of the German uh, industry for Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Yemen based in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He taught at the German and the US universities uh, with the University of California and regularly speaks at international conferences, trade affairs um, and workshops. He's also appeared as expert on artificial AI uh, Al Jazeera's show counting the cost. Kim has received a BSc in management and <coughs> economics from Otto von Gericht University, Magburg, a MSc and PhD in agricultural economics from the Humboldt University of Berlin, and has lived in jo Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the US. And this is the formal introduction that I wanted to give about Kim. And apart from this, in fact, I remember Kim, uh, we have been in touch from the time when you were with Otto Global. And I remember very well because like, you helped me connect down with the Oppo Global in the UK. And I, that's where I always mention on stage, you're very much approachable in the industry. So that's something which I should put on this platform. Uh, so before we begin down with the session, uh, Kim, in fact, like there is a few things I would like to ask you. One of the things is that, how do you, what is the role of GTEI? Because like, this is something that everybody would be interested to know as a chamber of commerce. Uh, how does GTEI support in digitization investments, startups, and among its partnership uh, countries and increase the members and the enterprise. How do you actually do this basically? As a GTI, as a Chamber of Commerce, what is your role and how does this promotion happen? Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for, for this kind introduction. Um, so now you know everything about me, I guess. Um, you know, we, uh, well, it's, it's been quite a ride um, over the last couple of years and uh, yes, I arrived um, about a year ago at Germany Trade and Invest. Um, so, yeah, first of all, it, it's not a chamber of commerce. It's actually the, the National Economic Development Agency of Germany, um, you know, which is basically responsible for um, especially uh, the internationalization of uh, the German economy. You know? So that's quite actually a large task. Um, uh, and. Um, you know, let, let me briefly, um, at least briefly, explain um, what the whole organization does, because then it makes sense, you know, to um, actually locate um, my own um, activities. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you're not familiar with economic development agencies, uh, actually every country has one. Almost every city has one. Every region in the world has one. You know? 
So some are bigger, some are smaller, but in the end, you know, they all do the same stuff. Uh, so first of all, they are respond. I mean, usually, let's put it this way. No? I mean, there are of course uh, no, some specialties uh, in some cases, um, but let's say the the full service economic development agency um, on uh, in, out there um, basically does uh, three things. First of all, it's a promotion agency for the location that is it's responsible for. In our case, it's Germany. Uh, so um, you know, one of the main tasks of our organization is to promote. Germany all across the world to inform about business opportunities in Germany, about fantastic things that are going on here uh, in terms of research, in terms of um, you know, innovation, in terms of digitization, uh, but you know, basically all the range of industrial topics which make Germany such a strong economy as it is. So this is called location marketing. Huh? So, yeah, so you can you know, do marketing for any sort of products, you know, I don't know, it could be your Adidas shoes, could be, I don't know, your clothes from Zalando, could be anything. You know, our job is to promote Germany as an economy in the world. Um, second, export. So, I mean, you know, Germany is kind of world champion in terms of exports. Um, and uh, this just did not happen over uh, just overnight. Uh, behind that, there is a huge machinery of export promotion activities, programs, and organizations. Again, you find this on a regional level. Well, so in Germany, the federal states, for instance, they have a lot of um, export promotion programs, uh, but we do this on a national level. Uh, and we have basically the flagship uh, programs all under one roof. It's called the market expansion program. And this is uh, where the typical German SME um, basically registers um, for a range of, I think it's about a hundred kind of specific export promotion programs to help German companies sell their stuff um, all across the world, going to um, including um, presence at uh, you know large trade fairs uh, for any sort of industrial topics. Um, but in a nutshell, you know that's the outbound side, you know export promotion. And there's a third pillar and that's foreign direct investment. That's the inbound side. and that means, Companies from all over the world um, uh, should be attracted to open an office in Germany. No? So it's the other way around. Everybody, basically, think about it. Everybody that's not here um, could potentially benefit from our economy, our resources, our talent, uh, our innovation in Germany. Um, and that's what kind of these people in our organization try to foster, which means they. Um, reach out to companies, to innovative companies and growing, especially, you know, of course, growing companies, um, expanding companies uh, that would consider opening an office in Germany. And of course, this could take any uh, sort of shape, could be a manufacturing um, place, could be even a research facility. Uh, but it could also be just a sales office, uh, which then later on, uh, you know, could expand into something bigger. But nevertheless, it's about increasing the footprint of these organizations. And our job is to support that because it's in national interest to create jobs in Germany, to diversify the economy, and especially to attract interesting, innovative companies you know, because all of that makes our economy stronger. So this is basically our organization in a nutshell. Um, we have about 400 people, uh, 50 of them all across the world because we have offices in um, you know, about um, 35 countries. Uh, so these people, you know, sit uh, basically on all continents and support our activities. Plus then we have a big office in Bonn, in North Rhine-Westphalia and the other offices in Berlin where I am stationed. So um, what, what I'm doing in terms of supporting startups and, uh, you know, uh, and supporting digitalization, um, you know, I, I run the team that is responsible for startups and um, digital ecosystems. And um, in a nutshell, you know, we, we support what's there out there in Germany. Now we have a similar approach. We support existing ecosystems, existing so-called digital hubs, communities of innovative companies, research, in, research institutions. Um, and uh, first of all, well, we promote them all across the world. We have certain visibility programs 
Well, also, for instance, we run a marketing campaign ourselves um, in a couple of countries all around the world. Um, second, uh, we, we promote uh, our startups from Germany at international um, tech events and tech fairs. You know, maybe you heard about uh, Web Summit and Slush and Viva Tech and all of those kind of events. Uh, we always bring a large delegation of startups all over there and organize events um, around it and so on. Um, yeah, but also we talk a lot to startups um, and companies uh, from um, from abroad that are not active um, in our digital ecosystem and, and, and need this and uh, you know this connection to innovative actors. Um, you know, and that's also uh, where we uh, support. Wonderful, that's nice to know. In fact, like there's something that I would like to ask you because I'm also an economic advisor with the World Trade Center so we, as we were in such and such as you share. But then if you notice, one of the problems that comes inside is, uh, are, are these chambers really active? That's one of the questions because why is it active? Is, are they really able to impose upon and pass across the, the chambers and the uh, roles of the ministry and the government towards reaching out to the mass roots. Um, that's one challenge that comes inside. Are they really active? And are they really able to uh, promote this? That's one of the questions. How do you see in this? The second thing that I intend to ask is, um, uh, again, uh, with um, GTEI, uh, how do you find the, uh, do, do you find the direct approach of the government really supporting you? Or is it like a private enterprise, which is there? How do you find this? Is the government of Germany supporting you for this? Well, um, I mean, we are a government agency. So, I mean, by definition, they are supporting us. But on the other hand side, the question is, of course, um, you know, how, how does it actually translate into operational support? Um, and, um, you know, it's, we work closely. I mean, so, you know, just to explain the whole construct here. Um, so we are actually organized as a company. But it's 100% owned by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, and uh, Climate Action. Uh, so we are a public company, so to speak. Um, and we work closely with all other government agencies, um, you know, which means other government ministries, but also um, the Office of the Chancery um, and uh, all German uh, embassies in the world, um, all German foreign chambers, um, well, the, you know, AHKs uh, all across the world, uh, but also we work with a lot of um, foreign ministries, foreign embassies, um, you know, foreign chambers, uh, making you know, basically all stakeholders that are active in the field of um, kind of international cooperation um, and uh, yeah, economic development. Hmm. Wonderful, Jim. And I, there is something that I would like to ask you. One of the things is like, uh, Germany is largely seen as a country which is specialized in mechanical engineering industries, the top of the value chain uh, when it comes to mechanical engineering industries or chemical industries. But then if you notice the trends are changing and even the students who are there uh, with the BSPI are especially right now focusing on digitization as the main concept which is there, not just in BSBI, everywhere around us is there. How do you see Germany adapting towards this change from the mechanical engineering industries towards the IoT based industries? How do you see this as trend and innovation scouting? Um, well, this is actually a pretty tough question. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite challenging um, you know, to, to find a, a good answer to that. Um, you know, let's put it this way. There's a lot of potential still out there for Germany um, to develop uh, you know, in this direction. Um, I mean, as you mentioned uh, correctly, Germany has a strong industrial backbone. Our economy is based upon, you know, the handicrafts company that developed into industrial companies about a hundred years ago uh, that drove the whole industrialization in Europe. Uh, and uh, you can still see that when you look at the large uh, corporates um, out there in Germany um, and, and, you know, the big um, SMEs in Germany, uh, the Wurz, yeah, or, um, you know, uh, Bosch, you know, you know, all of these companies, uh, they are all as in, they, you know, all industrial base, they yeah, all co come from this background. Um, uh, and in the end, they all face the same problems. Right? And, and, you know, this is the uh, transformation, the, the digital transformation of the economy, uh, get, basically getting ready um, for the next chapter in, um, in industry. Right? And you, 
of course, we can see that all around the world now, and uh, you know, we can face this everywhere that uh, digital technologies become so, uh, so much more relevant, you know, in all of these industry uh, sectors. Um, no, and I can tell you, this is this is really one of the main, also kind of national challenges um, that Germany is facing right now. No? And um, the ministry has set up uh, quite a range of uh, funding programs and initiatives. Um, you know, in order to support uh, not these uh, companies in Germany uh, to you know, basically learn more about digital technologies, yeah? lose also um, their fear. Yeah? Um, now because a lot of those uh, companies don't really know yet how to deal with digital uh, uh, technologies. They might see it as a threat. I mean, sometimes it is, of course, yeah? um, because there are a lot of disruptive technologies out there. But the but the but the the, the objective is um, to create a situation where they can actually benefit from this uh, trend. Uh, that's of course not easy um, for two reasons. On the one hand side, you need a mindset shift, uh, so you really have to transform how people think about it, especially the top management. And second, you need to make it happen on an operational level, and that's actually you know going down to the assembly line, going down to the workshops. Um, you know, and, and introduce slowly but steadily um, these technologies in order to uh, um, kind of uh, take the workforce uh, uh, on the shop floor with you, uh, the engineers, the mechanics, and all of those guys. Because for them, it's also a change. And the first uh, fear is, uh, you know, when there's a new technology, uh, does it mean I will lose my job? Yeah. Well. Um, if the company does not transform um, you know, quickly enough, this can of course happen. And it's of course um, a reality that we cannot save all jobs. But on the other side, you know, the net equation can turn into something positive if we're able to use these technologies in the right way and see the, the positive side about it and actually create business opportunities from it. Um, uh, so you know, that's basically the whole situation. I guess Germany faces the same challenges as all other countries it's just probably very very heavily affected from it because it had such a strong industrial base which was you know um, deeply rooted in you know old technologies uh, and old manufacturing processes in fact like uh, certain questions that have actually come down from my own um, when we go down to the classroom and we meet people who are uh, who are also students and who are also working as entrepreneurs. Uh, certain questions that they have come inside that have come inside is uh, they find uh, certain other markets also very attractive. For example, Estonia. Estonia is growing wonderful when it comes to uh, the digitization and the field of how fast they are actually um, supporting it on. So again, uh, uh, certain enterprises, startups, they believe like when there are so many options which are coming inside like Estonia. I think uh, Ukraine Kiev also also emerging faster, uh, and many more countries are emerging faster. So where do you find so that the startups have an advantage in Germany to utilize the advantage of the government schemes which are being supported for the startups especially? So sorry, can you repeat the the, the last part uh, again? Yes. I, I didn't do you get find it. That that Germany. Uh, is evolving as one of the most advantageous regions as compared to new startup zones, so new startup supporting countries such as Estonia, Kyiv, and uh, Ukraine, especially. And these countries are also giving quite a lot of attractive uh, supports. I think uh, Estonia is giving the digital residency for uh, all the all over the world for them to start up. So with these things, where do you think so that Germany is getting a competitive advantage? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're mentioning um, some very innovative um, regions and countries here. Um, you know, certainly, you know, they are quite uh, advanced in what they offer um, to, to startups. Uh, I mean, Estonia is really a prime example. Um, uh, with this e-residency, uh, they, they have a very um, well-organized startup scene that's very centralized, um, you know, and the actors work uh, very closely together. Um, which is fantastic, uh, and then they even have a lot of government support in it. Uh, so uh, it's not only um, on an operational level; uh, you know, they even have the political backup for that, uh, which, which is fantastic, of course. Huh? Um, you know, 
So, you know, comparing um, this setup to Germany um, you know, is, is of course difficult um, and, and Germany um, you know, can learn a lot from Estonia and from other countries. Um, I mean, this is also part of my role you know, that I basically uh, kind of gather the intelligence about European, especially European um, you know, digital ecosystems. Um, and and you know, in terms of uh, their startup support, in order to uh, basically provide reports um, uh, to the uh, ministry, uh, because this is this is exactly what we need over here. You know, Germany, of course, is a big country. Um, you know, and everything is you know well set up. Yeah, the political structures, the industry structures, and so on. Uh, so this is fantastic on the one hand side, but on the other hand side, of course, it's more difficult to change such a system because it's so big and established. You know, and that's of course where Estonia and other places have an advantage. Uh, um, they can basically just uh, accelerate uh, their transformation because there's not so much that they have to change and not so many people or organizations that they have to take with them. Um, you know, but nevertheless, uh, this is, you know, on, on a lot of different levels um, in the organizations happening. Um, I can see that uh, in the, you know, on an, of course, in the private sector, uh, there are a lot of service providers uh, um, supporting um, the public sector in Germany, not only consultancies you know, for, the, for digitalization and basically creating e-government uh, processes and structures, um, you know, but there are also a lot of startups uh, that can support um, you know, public uh, uh, organizations. Um, and you know, the good thing is you know, the, in Germany, the ministries are learning from others um, and uh, they, are, they are open and they're receptive uh, to ideas. Um, uh, for instance, um, you know, one of the main pain points for startups or for, for you know, innovative startups is that um, they don't have good access to government procurement because uh, government procurement is very, um, let's say, um, constrained, uh, you know, very strict rules um, that usually only can be and, and very complex. And you know, can only be managed by uh, companies um, that have either a lot of experience or a lot of resources to actually go through this process. But of course, right, if you're an agile and a small startup, um, you might not have the time or the resources to do that. So I know that in that sense, um, you know, there are initiatives in our government and also on different levels um, you know, to make it easier for startups uh, to have access to government procurement. Because in the end, the role of government can be to spur innovation and to drive certain um, trends um, before maybe the public sector picks, uh, um, the, the private sector uh, picks it up. Yeah? Um, so that uh, the, the startups can turn their solutions into marketable products um, you know, actually get ready for the private sector market. But if the government thinks that, you know, this is a strategically attractive technology um, or the, um, the startup, you know, is, is worth to be supported, um, uh, because in the end, the, uh, the outcomes will be positive um, for the economy and society, then they can step in uh, you know, first to take greater risks and also to be the first clients. And this is uh, and, uh, the, what, what startups need. Right? They need traction in the beginning. Right? They need um, um, uh, proof of concept. Uh, they need a buyer that does not only likes what they're doing, but is actually willing to pay for it. Yeah. And this is what you need as a barrier, as a startup. And um, that's why, uh, you know, they can create win-win situations um, uh, between the public sector and startups. Uh, and, and, and this can definitely help everyone then to, uh, you know, also catch up to other economies that are more agile just because they're smaller. Wonderful, Ben. Wonderful. That's really nice to know about this impact. Uh, I think there are quite a number of uh, questions coming inside from uh, the participants. And I, before I go down for Rodolfo's question, uh, I think one question that I would like to ask, and then we proceed down for the participants' question is that uh, uh, how do you find the German startups uh, and the German industries disrupting the American firms? Because this is one of the things. How are these German firms able to disrupt? Are they still right now uh, carrying that potential, or do you feel they still need to build up uh, for the changing times? How do you find this as compared with the American firms? 
Um, well, I guess the German startups are very much solid and very much, you know, um, you know, thorough um, in, in what they are doing. Um, so, you know, they are really working on a fantastic product. Um, and, um, you know, they, of course, that may take um, a little longer um, you know, when it comes to go to market, um, but at least they're working on something, um, you know, that's, uh, that has a long-term um, perspective. And, and also where they can actually, uh, you know, address the needs of their customers properly and they try to think it through um, as far as they can. Um, you know, we, I mean, this is really this um, still, you, you know, if you want to compare it you know, on, on, a, you know, on a national level, yeah, um, then we can generalize, of course, a little bit. Um, you know, so I would say the Americans will sell faster while the Germans um, engineer um, you know, a level longer. Focusing more on technology grown and the quality. Yeah. So, you know, and, and this also uh, leads me, you know, this, this is a very important, um, also part of our job because, um, the, you know, a lot of German startups are out there somewhere in Germany, yeah, could be at a technical university in Cottbus, yeah, nobody knows about it actually, yeah, uh, or, you know, could be in any place in Germany, it doesn't really matter, but there's fantastic stuff out there. But if they don't market themselves properly and proactively, they will not be seen and not be supported. They will not find uh, the right venture capital, they're not, not the right angel network and not the right backing and so on, um, you know, compared to uh, you know, other more outgoing, outspoken startups uh, that have different founders, uh, you know, maybe with an international background. Um, so you know, on a general level, um, you know, this, is, this is, let's say, on the one hand side, it's great. Uh, that they are working so thoroughly on their um, you know, products. On the other hand side, um, you know, I guess they can also learn a bit uh, more this uh, you know, self-marketing um, and be more self-confident in the market. Uh, I think let's go down to the questions. And Rodolf was, I was expecting a question from Rodolf. And I think the question is that, um, uh, thank you for that. He's wondering if uh, how and where can we pitch our startup ideas and business models uh, to the GTA? Is there opportunity for Latin American startups? As I know, Latin America is one of the main objectives for diplomatic and economic integration in German government. So how do you find that? One of the things is that he questioned on stating how can he pitch down his ideas and where he can raise the funds since he is here. And at the same time, how does the uh, relationship, the bilateral relationship between Germany and various countries down in Latin America. How does it go ahead in uh, trade prospects for you? Yeah, let me start with the second part of it. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, good relations to basically all uh, countries in the world, um, in including Latin America. Um, you know, it's, uh, we've, Last year, uh, we actually ran a soft landing program for Brazilian fintech companies um, into Germany. Uh, with you know, we brought a couple of uh, actors together on the German side. Um, it was organized by the embassy of Brazil in, in Berlin, um, and there were a couple of uh, you know fintech uh, associations in Brazil involved. Uh, you know, they sourced the startups, um, and then we basically. Uh, help the startups um, to learn more about Germany and also you know, getting more customers here and uh, settling down in Germany in this three-day soft landing program. Um, yeah, there was, there was a fantastic uh, cooperation. Um, and uh, you know, th you know, it's, it's, it's just a good example of how we can work together with such organizations. Um, but this was a structured program that we set up. Of course, that's a lot of effort and so on. Um, you know, but on the other hand side, we also work a lot with, um, of course, the German Chambers of Commerce, you know, the AHKs in Chile and Brazil and uh, Argentina and uh, Uruguay, you know, and, you know, all of these places um, in Latin America. Um, and usually uh, we, uh, plus, plus uh, uh, the economic development organizations of these countries, you know, um, uh, either the ones uh, in the countries, you know, or if they have an office in Germany or in Europe that's taking care of the German market, um, then we also, of course, work with them because it's easier. Uh, but nevertheless, um, we usually hold uh, presentations um, in front of startup delegations uh, from these countries, uh, you know, where we give them um, a basic overview of what's going on here, 
um, first of all about the um, potential in the market um, and then about regulatory issues, how they can actually participate. Um, could be about incentive programs, could about you know, could be about the tax situation, could be about legal aspects of founding a company here. Um, but of course, uh, you know, for, for these people from these countries also have questions in terms of visa um, regulation and how that works. Um, so you know, sometimes we even uh, go down that road. Um, no, so this is what we're doing anyway. So, so uh, but you're asking specifically um, how you can pitch ideas and business models to GTAI um, depends really on uh, why. Uh, well, what, why would you do that? Uh, what do you want to achieve with that? Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to open an office in Germany and you need our support and you want to pitch in order to tell us uh, more what you're doing, that's totally fine. Everybody does that. Every company can do that. Um, if it's just for general input, and actually, this is not really where we are probably the best context here, because you know we don't interfere actually with the actual activities of these um, startups. We we work specifically on international expansion, yeah. focusing on the investors to come inside and to invest in Germany. That's the main. Exactly. So um, you know, uh, here and there, we have some interactions with startups where we do some mentoring and coaching, but usually that's part of some structured programs. Um, you know, but uh, when you when you have uh, questions regarding, um, you know, you, you want to uh, get feedback on your business model, um, you know, on your financials, on your growth uh, plans and all of that, you know, like say typical startup uh, questions, um, and we are really not the, the right people for that. First of all, it's not our job. And, and second, we are also not experts in that. You, know, you might find uh, some actual startup mentors uh, much more useful. But then like uh, the thing is, uh, since a lot of people who come down here, they are willing to become investors. And since you know that Berlin has quite a lot of uh, uh, migrating uh, population, which is diverse migrating population, now, a lot of people who come down to study in BSBI, who take up the programs relating to entrepreneurship, their main objective is that like they are also investors who are looking forward for starting up over here. So they are studying here, they're looking forward for a startup. So again, the scale might differ. The scale of the investments could be like a startup uh, where they're planning to start a firm over here, invest the money from the home country. So based on that, is there a particular amount based on which that you would say that uh, to this particular amount, we do support and it's much easier or beyond a particular amount when, for example, if it's more than uh, 25,000 euros when it comes, then like we involve ourselves or if it is lesser than 25,000 euros, we do not involve. Is there anything like that for the investors? Um, I mean, this is, I guess, I mean, you know, if I get it right, this is, a, for me, this sounds like a typical foreign direct investment topic. Yes, exactly. That's um, the, that's what I was putting across. As a foreign direct investor, do you have any particular amount after beyond the amount with where you would get involved? Or like, how, how do you see this? Um, in our organization, at least, um, it, it's very simple. Um, the moment you create jobs, uh, we can support you. OK? Um, if you have questions around, how do I find my uh, customer? Um, where's my, where can I, uh, I don't know, no? um, how can I? Uh, you know, structure my sales funnel and so on, um, uh, to which contacts can I reach out, all of these type of business development questions and sales questions, we will not help you. Um, this is because uh, we have a certain government mandate. Um, and uh, for these type of support, um, you can use private actors in the market. Um, whereas settling down in Germany, you know, finding an office, employing people on the ground, um, then, you know, of course, the more the better, but in the end, it's not really about your expenditures. Um, it's about how many jobs you create. And actually, if you create a job, that's wonderful. If you create a thousand jobs, even better. You know? So, you know, this is, but if you create zero jobs um, and just basically employ yourself, or not even yourself, because you don't want to open an office and just sell into Germany, that's a different story. Wonderful. I think I have a few more questions relating to this, but then let me ask Gaurav because I think Gaurav has a question uh, where he mentions down that world is going uh, into the technology and data-driven approaches. 
how do you analyze these pros and the cons which are there? How do you analyze where is Germany's position, especially when it comes to the data-driven and technology-based approaches? Where are we standing in terms of innovation? This is one right question to know where, where is Germany right now uh, in terms of innovation, with also the change of the governments and everything also. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty large question, actually. Um, uh, and uh, I guess, um, you know, Let's, let's put it this way. I, I could try to answer this, but uh, you know, the actual answer uh, should come, let's say, from a German minister, you know, uh, because they are actually responsible um, for putting Germany out there where they are supposed to be. Um, uh, but uh, you know, from our point of view, um, I mean, first of all, yes, uh, you know, we totally agree that technology and data is all, you know is everything, and you know, it will become even more important in the future. Everybody knows this. Um, and we have to react to that. Um, uh, and, and certainly um, there's a lot of room for improvement in Germany. Uh, and you know, it's you know, one of the key, let's say, challenges in Germany is regulation. Uh, and uh, it's a lot about data protection on the one hand side, but it's also about the, the support into future technologies. You now, when we talk about, for instance, artificial intelligence, um, Germany has a lot of ex excellent researchers. And especially in the south of Germany, you know, fantastic um, uh, research institutes um, and, and research, you know, hubs. Um, you, know, and, you know, especially the state of Baden-Württemberg puts a lot of money into that. Um, so, you know, seemingly, yeah, when they open a campus for like, I don't know, 40 or 60 million, yeah, in the city of Hamburg or something, uh, you know, that's fantastic for them. Um, and also, you know, uh, compared to other initiatives and projects inside Germany, that's quite significant. Um, but of course, uh, you know, the world doesn't stand still um, and Germany is, uh, you know, has, faces uh, international competition, um, especially from China, especially from the US, um, which put a multiple of money into the development of such technologies and employ thousands and thousands more people in these fields. Um, you know, and in, in the end, we talk about the next generation of technologies. We don't talk about like 5G or 6G. You know? We talk about what happens actually with these technologies and what kind of stuff you can do with that. You know, we talk about edge uh, um, you know, computing, talk about quantum computing. Um, you know, this is really what's happening um, and what will uh, uh, kind of determine the future of our economies, not in five or 10 years, but in 20 or 50 years. And we already know that. Yeah. So that's why. Um, you know, it's important to act now and to invest also significant amounts into the future, because if you don't catch up, you will be a follower. You will not be the leader in these technologies. And Germany used to be a leader when it comes to, you know, um, the automotive, um, you know, and a lot of industrial topics, you know. Um, of course, it was a very comfortable situation. You could, you know, basically live off a century uh, and feed uh, a whole country uh, and, and develop the country into, um, you know, into a great economy, but times will change. Tim, let me put you in trouble right now with this question. Who do you think is the leader? Very good question. I mean, it really depends on the the, the technology field, I guess. Um, you know, in some in some fields, uh, China is great. And sometimes the US, sometimes Canada, but also you know the Nordics are good in some fields. Uh, but but also countries you know like uh, Japan and Korea, you know, up and coming. Um, you know. And in, in Europe, who do you think so is still leading? Is it Sweden, Switzerland? How do you find that? Netherlands? How do you find them as competitors? Do you find them as competitors? How do you find this as a healthy competitor? I cannot, I cannot uh, pick a country here. This is too, the question is too broad for that. Um. <laughs> I get this. And, uh, no, but, but you know, the, the, the key aspect, I mean, we talk a lot about Germany here. Huh? So it's it's not that Germany is bad at these things. It's just that um, they are not supporting it, not fostering it, um, you know, with public money and attention, um, and you know, uh, compared to other countries, you know, on a relative scale. And as I said, Germany is a big country. Uh, you cannot forget that. We cannot uh, compare ourselves to Sweden, um, you know, or to to even not even the UK. You know, I mean, they have a lot less people. You know, and uh, then uh, also, you know, not talking about Estonia. Um, Germany is a huge country, it's a huge population, it's a huge economy. You know? So if you want to put the country on top of other countries, also in uh, a few decades, 
it requires a lot more in absolute terms uh, in investing um, and uh, efforts. I think there are a few more, many questions coming in, Sarah. I think if I'm just putting in one question, which is a talk of the uh, talk of the period generation as well. Uh, Saina has a question stating that how do you find this artificial intelligence disrupting the whole industrial mechanism of working? So how do you find the changes, especially with uh, machines uh, being replaced by artificial intelligence, which, which includes the cobots? Um, and the bots which are coming and say, so how do you find this all together? Well, I mean, I find this, uh, I mean, personally, I find this super exciting. Um, uh, uh, but on the other hand side, um, you know, it also needs to be managed uh, right. Because um, in the end, it's a technology, right? It's, you know, it's there, yeah. And, um, but, it, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's handled by people. Uh, it's applied by people and people decide, um, you know, if they want to put AI, let's say into a recruiting software, uh, you know, that uh, makes it easier uh, to, to basically, you know, recruit uh, the right people, you know, and streamline your processes over there, or um, in order to, I don't know, um, uh, uh, kind of employ it in industrial processes, let's say in terms of maintenance uh, and detection of, uh, you know, um, cracks, you know, in your system, um, and you can basically foresee this with artificial intelligence. I mean, that's great. You know? Also, in terms of health predictions, you know, um, these are all usually very positive uh, applications. Um, um, so, it, uh, the the evidence is out there that artificial intelligence can really, uh, you know, create value um, for the economy and for the people out there, you know, for our society. Um, on the other hand side, uh, it can also be a threat. Well, when it comes about uh, you know uh, data protection um, and also systems that are self-learning and uh, you know might now um, support like a positive cause, uh, which then you know if you actually kind of simulate that up into the future, um, you know can turn into something negative. Uh, you know you really have to take care of that, yeah, because some with you know, with artificial intelligence, something can happen in the future that you don't know yet today. Um, so you, it's really about the framework of application that you need. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, artificial intelligence is a strong driver of digital transformation of the economy, of especially the industrial space in Germany. Um, and that can create uh, tensions uh, you know, in the workforce when uh, you know, companies can streamline their production systems uh, and, and you know, people will lose their jobs because a machine can, uh, can do it better and faster. Uh, and cheaper and especially more reliably, yeah, which is also you know one important aspect. Um, so this is a, this is good and bad at the same time, depending uh, you know who you ask and uh, and that's why it's so important to look at the application of artificial intelligence comprehensively um, and really kind of consider all the different implications uh, that it has uh, because in the end, it doesn't you, you will not win. Um, if it creates harm on the one hand side and, and you know some positive aspects on the other side, you can completely forget about it because you know it'll turn around uh, in the end. Um, I think I have this question because uh, what is it that makes uh, I want to hear this from your side, uh, Kim. Like, what is it that makes the US to create a lot of firms such as Tesla? Um, uh, support down such kinds of organizations such as Tesla, which are extremely futuristic in their technology-driven uh, space. But then what is it that um, uh, that the German startups are not able to do this uh, for the future industries? Where do you think so that the, the, the vacuum flies? Is it the ecosystem or how do you find this? Well, um, of course, we don't have a second Tesla in Germany, but at least we have some other, you know, Quite um, you know revolution revolutionizing um, startups out there, mm, which are maybe not that well known uh, at that scale, yeah, because they don't have a freak as a CEO. Um, but you know they are actually uh, you know transforming um, whole economies already, basically under the radar, so to speak. No? I mean you know Germany is pretty strong in the fintech space and the mobility space. Um, you know companies. Uh, you know, like uh, ESA Aerospace, you know, um, in the space uh, field, but also Volocopter, you know, um, 
you know, they are globally leading um, you know, technology startups um, in, in their own uh, niches, yeah? um, but also, you know, in terms of uh, intro tech, uh, you know, but also um, you know, when it comes to um, B2B, um, you know, uh, SaaS uh, models and, and uh, B2B commerce, you know, there are quite a good of, quite a number of really good startups out there. Um, so I wouldn't say it's so much about the ecosystem. Um, I mean, also, it's sometimes it's about, I mean, if you really want to compare this, I mean, uh, com Germany compared to the US, um, you know, the US uh, has more than uh, four times uh, more people. Uh, so it's a larger country, of course. And that also makes it easier to, you know, naturally, you will create a lot more talent. I mean, look at India. Yeah? Um, you have more than a billion people. Uh, and of course, a lot of talent will just naturally, uh, you know, come out of that, um, just because it's huge um, and the, the potential is there. Um, but nevertheless, um, you know, let me point out, uh, you know, a few things uh, that might, you know, might be uh, something that that you you had in mind when you asked this question. No, of course, creating a company of that size, like Tesla, is something very unique. No? Um, so we can compare, you know, when we look at the largest startups on earth, you know, um, German, Germany's largest startup is Celonis. You know, it was a fantastic success story from Munich. You know. They're they are amazing. Um, but this is nothing compared to, you know, decacorns from China, from the US, sometimes even from, Paris, from France and Great Britain. Um, you know, that are out there, you know, companies you know, that reached evaluation, you know, that is larger as most uh, industrial companies, uh, you know, employing 50,000 people or more. You know. And this is something very unique. And uh, it, it takes a lot of investment to, to push a company to that level. Um, and that doesn't happen very often, of course. Uh, and uh, the number of um, investors in the world that actually support development and can actually write tickets um, that are a couple hundred million uh, are not so many. And usually you don't find them in Germany. Uh, you know, there are a couple, not from Germany, but at least investing in Germany, you know, like Sequoia um, or Tiger Global or even like Mubadala from uh, Abu Dhabi um, you know, or SoftBank. But, but you know, the, the large scale investors are not as much present in Germany as in other uh, regions of the world. Nice to know. Okay, a few questions again. So it's slightly a uh, repeated question. I'm taking only the main uh, thing that uh, Anandu wishes to ask this question. He says that uh, uh, way to get in touch with the investors, because again, uh, the, since GTI helps in connecting people and fostering trade, um, so how could uh, they get in touch uh, is there any kind of a uh, service that GTI offers or like, do you have any uh, digital portal through which they can also access these investors? How does it work? Well, that's actually a pretty good question. And I know that uh, this is very critical for a lot of, um, you know, founders, uh, especially in the early days. Um, you know, we are a national agency. We, we, you know, we work basically on a different level. Um, we have certain relations with investors, but that is certainly, um, you know, not really the space uh, of investors that you that you are aiming for. Um, usually, the best way is, um, you know, to join a community, um, and you know, Berlin is of course the best place in Germany for that, um, because you need your networks. You need to go out, um, you know, meet people, talk to them. And then create personal connections. And then uh, after some time, one person will refer you to another person. You know, you might not know someone, but you know someone who knows someone. You know, and th this is how it starts. You know, um, you're building your personal network. Um, but of course, um, there are certain organizations that try to bring investors together with uh, founders and, and early stage startups. Um, you know, there is a business angel club um, in Berlin. Um, you know, there are uh, regular startup meetups um, in, in Berlin, but there are also you know, certain um, like places 
at events where and events where you can meet potential investors. Uh, could be a startup conference, um, but could also be like a pitch event, um, you know, at a co-working space uh, somewhere in the city. Now, it's just about getting out there and, and talking to people. Um, so we don't, uh, again, we don't support this um, on a general scale. You know, on the other hand side, um, there is something that we do, but this is only for the established startups in our digital hub ecosystem, uh, because we support these 12 digital hubs across Germany and we internationalize the whole ecosystem. It has more than 2,400 startups. They're all members in the 12 digital hubs across Germany. Um, so, so, you know, some activities that we are doing is we bring these startup, we bring startup delegations to large tech events, uh, as I mentioned before. And uh, uh, as part of our work there, um, we also create networking opportunities with investors. Uh, but this means, let's, say, no, let's face it, usually these are startups, established startups um, that are raising their seed round or series A round. You know, and they are looking for tickets like 500,000 uh, to 5 million. Um, and, you know, and at these events, you find these investors and you know, we, we create, again, like these networking opportunities so they can find each other. But you know, for the startup, you know, this is just one touch point in the year. Uh, and, and this is not much. You know? The startups that we support, they have basically their own networks, their own hubs, their own uh, you know touch points with a lot of other investors uh, all across the year, um, and, and we are just supporting on top of it uh, a little bit. You know, just to put this into relation. Wonderful, Jim. Kim, I think uh, there are a couple of things that I would like to ask you based on your experience in this. Uh, uh, Field across. Uh, one of the things is how do you think? Because I'm putting in one question of uh, earlier asked question of Manoj, where the question comes down that um, how do you think uh, that uh, GTAI as an organization can also uh, encourage support, uh, though it not be directly with your uh, part, but then how do you think they can directly support business incubation centers, uh, which supports entrepreneurs? The second thing is, uh, how do you support academic uh, institutions, especially uh, academic research, which is turning on down inside that? So, is GTI anywhere uh, involved in this with the funds for uh, business incubation centers, with other similar um, researchers and everything? Uh, short answer is no, um, we don't do that. Um... Important uh, for us is, you know, we don't manage our own funds. We don't invest. We don't, you know, basically hand out uh, tickets uh, uh, to organizations. No? Um, this is either this is done by the by the ministry, um, not directly. The, the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs has certain schemes where they can support um, uh, organizations directly, but this is independent of our work. Um, but usually the um, the incubation centers, uh, you know, and research institutes and whatnot, huh? um, you know, you're talking about, they're usually funded on a, on a, a regional scale. Huh? So that's either huh, on, on a state level in Germany. Huh? So um, then the, huh, the respective ministry um, or the economic development agency of that state, or even the city huh, where it's placed, you know, they jointly um, finance, uh, you know, such institutions. Wonderful. That's really interesting to know from your side. And I think like uh, uh, one nice interesting question that comes from Mohamed Yunus is that uh, the changing times of the IoT, uh, there is this virtual collaborative commons which is coming and said, why, why should we, as a startup, there are plenty of challenges and uh, why can we hire freelancers more than hiring employees? So what is your, uh, your general view on the same thing? Well, I mean, this is a strategic question, of course, huh? um, and it's, you know, there is not a general answer to that. Uh, I guess a lot of startups are actually working with freelancers, um, but you really have to, you know, really have to think through why you would want to do that. You know? um, of course, it gives you flexibility. You can hire and fire people, you know, uh, quite easily. Um, 
On the other hand side, it's much more difficult to keep track uh, and to monitor and supervise them uh, because they are not really officially part of your organization. And it's not only your choice if they want to work with you, you know, it's also their choice. You know, um, you, depends on the contract, uh, co uh, contract uh, structure, of course, no, that you have with them, you know, they might just leave. Um, you know, and they will uh, uh, leave um, a gap in your organization structure. Um, in, you know, so, so you should never actually um, employ freelancers for critical positions you know, in your organization uh, uh, because you need to make sure to replace them then somehow. Um, uh, it's, it's a risk issue. And this is on the one hand side a risk issue. The other risk issue is uh, that they take knowledge, uh, you know, they have access to knowledge, maybe even proprietary knowledge. Um, uh, that makes your organization and your startup unique. Yeah, it could be the backbone of it, could be you know, really critical for your business model. Yeah, and then just leave and take it with you and you cannot do anything about it. Um, so that's why it, you know, usually you use freelancers when you wanna um, temporarily, yeah, where you build up capacity quickly and then later on fill it with um, a, a permanent stuff. Uh, or you already know from the beginning that it's temporary and you just need someone to support here and there. You know? On the other hand side, of course, um, you can use uh, uh, freelancers um, for activities um, such as uh, uh, website design or um, you know, graphic design you know, for activities you might not need a permanent staff position for. Uh, you, could, you just have, let's say, small projects uh, and then it's easy to use a freelancer because you know, when the project is over, uh, you don't need that person anymore. So, and, and I can tell you, especially in the, um, you know, it, it, the, there's a certain economics about it as well. Um, and it, it goes even that far that startups are willing to pay the freelancers more in order to have the flexibility, but it really depends on the activities. You know? So it's not only about the money issue, you know? um, it's, it's really about the whole setup. Uh, you need to really make sure you know why you use them and uh, control your risks. Okay, that's, that's nice to know because still the times are pushing organizations for um, pros and cons are there through this one. And I think uh, the other question is also very much interesting because Lalit has this question that what are the challenges post the pandemic? Uh, because right now, how do you find this challenge? Because uh, now, if you notice, when you want the investors to come inside and invest in Germany, and post the pandemic, there's a lot of uh, things which are crippling people's trust and the policies and the restrictions which are really crippling them. Uh, how do you find this, especially post pandemic, to many startups in the downstream of the value creation, uh, whether it's time to more focus on upstream, how government is supporting these startups or the GTA? How do you find this? Well, to be honest, um, I'm not quite sure if I really understand uh, upstream and downstream in this context. Yes. Um, Maybe, uh, if I'm just in simple words putting this, how do you find this, especially post the pandemic, to attract the investors to Germany? Uh, in, in, you mean in general investors to uh, Germany? In general, because post the pandemic, there's quite a lot of changes because the changes are that policies are still not clear how it's opening up because uh, investors coming inside, shall they invest right now or shall they wait for another six months? So these are certain things which are quite inconclusive. So at this point of time, how do you find this? That is it challenging to uh, bin the investors and ask them to come into uh, Germany or like is it much more smooth? How do you find that post pandemic? Um, so, you know, the experience um, has been so far that have in the beginning of the process, uh, so uh, you know, the, the um, upstream process, uh, um, actual, actually using digital technologies such you know video calls uh, and uh, cloud services and so on uh, for sharing documents and all of that, you know, and made things a lot faster. Uh, so actually, that's a good, that was, so that was a positive effect. You know? And uh, probably you know, as you can imagine, um, across you know multiple applications. Um, you know, video, video calls are quite efficient um, and, uh, you know, they will, they will not go away. Uh, people will use it as much as they can, wherever it makes sense. So that you know, brings us to the downstream activities. Um, you know, the company, of course, needs to uh, make a site visit. They need to sit down, um, get a feel 
um, for the country, for the um, location. And of course, um, you know, with them um, in, uh, you know, unsecure um, environment, business climate on the one hand side, but also regulatory issues like uh, traveling um, restrictions and so on. Of course, that's a lot diffi more difficult nowadays. But nevertheless, there are exceptions when it comes to these type of business activities. Um, uh, so we've seen actually people getting visas, um, even in times when it was very difficult, um, when they wanted to make significant investments in Germany. Um, sometimes our organization coordinated um, with the embassy um, and the, the federal ministry and the federal chancellery in Germany um, to create these exceptions. Um, but of course, uh, you know, these were, let's say, the difficult times of like a couple of months ago yeah, or one year ago uh, when things were actually really difficult. Um, uh, then we only could create these uh, loopholes kind of, uh, or these exceptions, let's say, um, for very special people. Uh, you know, there was one guy um, that wanted to come from the Silicon Valley uh, to make an investment um, in, in a Berlin startup, actually. To, and that startup became a unicorn um, with this investment. Uh, so he, he basically came with a, a couple hundred million in his pocket um, uh, to, to really make lead a large funding round. And we supported that uh, process. Um, and, and it happened in the end. But of course, these are exceptions. No? Uh, this is very unique. But nowadays, actually, um, you know, everything, I mean, we still are basically, I don't know if it's post pandemic or at the end of a pandemic. I mean, who knows if it's actually the beginning of the next pandemic. Huh? <laughs> um, so, but in general, people got used to it. Um, and also our government authorities got used to, uh, you know, the new situation. And it's, it's not that difficult anymore to actually cross borders, uh, especially when you have, uh, you know, for, for business reasons. Um, so, that's why, um, you know, let's say the tough days are over uh, and, you know, when, whenever you want to do business, um, there are not these major restrictions anymore. There is no straight lockdown anymore in Germany. You can travel wherever you want inside the country. Um, you can visit offices, you can visit spaces, you can talk to everyone, it's, uh, hold meetings, everything is fine, basically. There are a couple more questions. The questions are coming inside. So. I think one of the questions that uh, Rodolphe has for you is that uh, crypto economic models and the business models based on crypto economy, how is the German government position of this? Because uh, cryptocurrency is digital currency and I'm mentioning especially the cryptocurrency being something um, which is ungoverned. How do you see this that, what's the position of the German government? Crypto economic models. I don't know, no, that's not my field. Okay, and uh, the other question that comes inside is that uh, digital technologies are helping the new asset like companies to build better brand identity in today's competitive market. So uh, do you think that, can you suggest few technologies supporting the asset like startup companies for developing a better brand identity? So as startups for brand identity, how do you find this? Well, I... Is the question that uh, I can name a couple? Yes, as digital company technologies are helping the new asset like companies to build, build a better brand identity. In now. Can you suggest a few technologies which are actually supporting the asset like startups like SaaS? I suppose the question is like SaaS and how they actually helping them build a brand identity. And are there any uh, German firms which are there which help across uh, in delivering these services? Well, I'm not sure if I get this question correctly, but you know, it seems to be like a marketing question to me. Slightly um, marketing about the slightly on strategic for part of it. So, what's your view based on this? Yeah, I don't know what that has. Why? What? Why, why, why does it? I mean, I don't get it. Uh, why that has something to do with uh, digital technologies? Um, I mean, you can have marketing strategies left and right. Uh, you know, whatever you want to do in order to create brand awareness. Um, but then. Really, uh, how are the SaaS firms uh, growing in Germany? What is your view on this? And the, you mean uh, the SaaS business models uh, and companies? Software as a service, software as a service uh, based firms. 
whoever like the, the IT based firms which are there, how are they growing in Germany? Are, are they, is Germany still believing dependent on outsourced organizations or are German startups able to build their own SaaS based technologies? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the market is actually booming, um, you know, for, um, you know, B2B SaaS uh, technologies. Uh, this is one of the strongest, uh, you know, uh, business models, um, you know, I mean, actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, this in, in Germany, um, you know, uh, SaaS business models, um, you know, is the number one uh, kind of type of business model uh, of all startups in Germany. Um, it's more than one quarter. Um, more than one quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you have online platforms, which is like 15%, uh, software development, 11%, e-commerce, 10%. You know? So, uh, you know, SaaS business models is very popular. I mean, you can imagine basically all major, um, you know, startups probably that you know of are SaaS business models, um, especially in the B2B space. Um, but this, yeah, it's booming because in the end, um, you know, as I said, now the, of course you can go B2C and then, you know, you can basically target, you know, like the, the end consumers, but um, individual people, but nevertheless, um, because the economy is so strong, you have uh, so many um, SMEs and, and corporates out there, you know, and th they need support in streamlining their operations and digitalizing their own processes. You know? I mean, that's why uh, when you look at the unicorns uh, in Germany, you know, Celones uh, is B2B SaaS, yeah? not the number one contentful uh, is B2B SaaS. Um, Personio, number three in Germany. Yeah, HR software basically, you know, B2B SaaS, you know, or, or you know, Clark uh, for on WeFox for um, uh, insurance, right? Yeah, kind of in the middle, or Mambu uh, for uh, banking software. It's all B2B SaaS models. That's really interesting to know across the arm. And um, I think with this, we would end the session. If there are no questions, uh, it's been a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Kim for the session. And uh, it was quite, uh, I think uh, the only thing is that uh, um, the pandemic has kept uh, the academic activities also pretty uh, um, paralyzed because students cannot visit yet. In fact, we, uh, at the school, we have kept as much open for the students to visit provided they have the mandatory tests and everything also. And in fact, that is one of the reasons uh, also we hope that Kim could should join down to the school once the activities are there completely. You should also join down for uh, another session, a similar session with more interactions. And it's been wonderful to have you here for the program and the participants as well. I thank all the participants who came there. And uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks a lot from my side. Um, thank you for the wonderful questions. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure being here and uh, you know, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.